I'm so glad to get this chair back. <laughs> I said something recently, and I should have known that after saying it, God was going to do it one way or another. Cause the, the brightness of the, the summer day, when there's clear blue skies to shine that I wouldn't be able to use my normal setup in the camera and everything, and caused me to have to move everything around so that not being able to use the same chair that I normally use, this little patio chair that's kind of cute, you know, cute, <laughs> that would be able to sit in this big sprawling back, laid back chair, you know, kind of like camper. Yeah, cool, dude. <laughs> But because I kind of mentioned it, I should have known God was going to do it. It's kind of interesting that way. Is that a lot of things that happen in my life, I don't pray the way most people pray. I kind of like mention it to God, and God does it. And it was like that kind of personal intimacy I enjoy more than I do the formal prayers that... You know, I mean, I, I've prayed in church, you know, and people get all, you know, goo-goo-eyed about it at times, you know, and it's like, well, yeah, it sounds nice, but that's just because I'm a, you know, speaker, you know, I can speak eloquently and use elocution, and articulation is the propensity with which I am able to enunciate the whatever, and you know what I'm saying, sound like a Pharisee, you know, I mean, people like Pharisee prayers, they really do, you know, they like people that, you know, sound good, you know, and, well, you know, when I pray, I sound good, you know, I was like, okay, but more than that, without being a hypocrite, because what I do pray when I pray out loud, when people are there, is that I'm praying because Jesus said the same thing one time about how when you pray, you know, he prayed one time, he said, Father, I know you hear me, so I'm just praying for the people, and that's what he said, you know, before he even started praying, I'm like, ah, and that got me over my wanting not to pray in public with people because people would be, you know, like caught up in the prayer rather than caught up in the there or the person that we're praying to, you know, about what we are praying for. And because I've been involved in uh, Calvary Chapel Costa Mesa's Men's Prayer Watch, you know, that has, in the middle of the night, praying for the church's needs, and I don't know if they still do it, but when I was there, um, all night long, every night of the week, there would be a prayer watch going on, you know, people praying in the prayer room. Maybe not always in the prayer room, but mostly in the prayer room, unless something was scheduled there. But mostly in the prayer room in the middle of the night, you know, for the needs of the church and for people in the church. And it wasn't advertised too often. You know, once in a while, you know, there'd be a sign up for volunteers, you know, and you'd volunteer to go pray. You know, and you just get this little short thing, you know, like, George, Salvation, Betty, Finances, David, whatever. But you were taught by way of the other men that were there to, as you pray over this list, looking at it and letting the Holy Spirit give you a word of knowledge, a word of wisdom, you yielded yourself to intercede, into, well, to, I start to say, intercede and intercessory at the same time, which was kind of an interesting word because I was coming up with something that was going to go into cessation. So I was like, no, that's not a word, Michael. But you, you learn to get into this perspective of being the same as Jesus, interceding for the people, but letting go of your ideas and letting God speak what he wants for that person at a particular time. And it was really kind of interesting. It was a whole development for me of, of just fascination about what the Spirit of God could do with you if you let go of your own, you know, understanding, so to speak, and let God use His will to accomplish His purposes. And at that point in time, operating in the gifts of Spirit, it was heady experience for me. Wow, awesome time in those days, you know. Still get awesome times, but now I get something that I laugh about, you know, that people don't understand completely because I'll make comments about it. They don't, they don't get it. It's kind of like when I say, well, you know, the Lord brought the brightness so that I'd sit over here because I kind of wanted my chair, you know, and I kind of enjoyed, you know, having my chair, you know. It's kind of like I missed it because my wife was always sitting in her chair just like this, and, you know, she's always relaxing, you know, kind of like, you know, kind of like, 
just thrilled, you know, and I'd go sit and do the ministry, and I was like, you know, and I, I recorded a few of them like this in this chair, but it was kind of like, you know, so I had this kind of like little in the back of my mind thing, you know, and kind of mentioned it to the Lord once, and sure enough, I should have known God worked it out, you know, I mean, he does that for me, little things, you know, or like, sometimes when I want a Pepsi, you know, and I don't have enough money, you know, somehow there'd be this, just the right amount of change. Or what's even weirder is when someone comes up and says, you want a Pepsi? If you insist, <laughs> yeah, you want to make my day? Give me a Pepsi. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, seriously, you know, it's like, hey, they don't know, and people don't know, but God knows. And so when, when things like that happen, what I call the coinkadink experience, coinkadink, you know, coincidence, that I know ahead of time what's going to happen, and then when God does do it, then it comes through, and I give God the glory and the credit for it. It's obvious to me that God did it. My wife hates that. Matter of fact, that's the title of this this little kind of like devotion. I was like, <laughs> she hates me, <laughs> and she said it a lot. My wife has come up to me, Lori, my wife. I gotta make sure, you know, because I've been married before, so I gotta say, Lori, my wife. Lori, Lori, <laughs> Lori, my wife. Um, Lori has come up to me and said, in, in sincerity, I mean, kind of a smile on her face, but, you know, in all sincerity, I hate you. You know, and she's almost like, you know, wants to take her fist and pound on my chest, because she's only yay high, you know, so she can pound on my chest and she can't reach up. <laughs> okay, she's not that short, but she, you know, she's only yay high, so she can pound on my chest, you know, and I'm kind of laughing because I'm like, what? 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 You know, kind of what? You know, and uh, he says, "You did it." And I'm like, "What? You said it. What? You know?" And then she'll tell me what I said, and I go, "Well, yeah." Well, I was in my devotional today. Oh, <laughs> or you know, something will go on, and I'll say, "You know, you gotta be careful if you do this, you get this." And then sure enough, at the end of the day, she'll have done that and got that, and it's like. How did you know? <laughs> you know what I mean? It's one of those things. It's a coinkadink. You know, it's like God verifying and validating who you are, as you are, the way you are, in what God has given you to do. Now, for me, I'm anointed. You know, God has has um, taken some, you know, um, water and poured it over my head. And I got baptized. So I'm anointed. <laughs> Sorry, I you know I have a hard time taking too serious what people take so serious because surely they can't be serious because I mean come on now here David you know gets anointed you know and he's just some shepherd's kid you know a shepherd's kid you know and he's like the youngest of the whatever you know and sure enough he becomes king which is kind of like a trippy thing you know when you think about it because here you got all these other guys you know and you got Saul and people pick Saul to be king you know and so what's God pick you know and the least of these, you know, to become the most of the greatest of all, you know. Right. I think that's kind of like an in-your-face kind of thing, you know. At least I think so. And yet he still couldn't build the temple. Story there, you know, and I'm not going there. But the laughing part is that I enjoy this idea of what people try to make so special or so big and so outrageous, you know, when I just kind of like after a while take it for granted that, hey, it's God after all, who are you talking about? I mean, the one thing I really enjoy lately is I enjoy this guy named um, Francis Chan, because he takes an attitude that I like to the scripture, and he says, you know, there's a lot more in here than you think, you know, and he, you know, do you realize what you're saying, you know, when you study this, you know, do you get it, you know, like there's, there's a whole lot more involved than just what you think you know. I mean, we're talking about God, who's bigger than we all know. So maybe we ought to take a better look or lesser look in what we think we know and realize we don't know as much as we thought we knew. You get it? And that's where I've always been. You know, it's like I always thought anything that expands God or my appreciation of God or God in a bigger way I figured was in the word in some way, you know, and that had to be there because to me God is bigger. Otherwise, why use the word God? I mean, He can't be smaller because then it's just man-made, you know. And then I figured it's religion. 
So whenever people are telling me things like God can't do or God will do or God this or God that, I just go, forget the first word because that's what you can do with whatever it is you're saying. You can stick it right where it belongs because guess what? You can't put the word God in it. Once you put the word God, you should go back to generation, generation. You should go back to Genesis 1 and remember it says, in the beginning, God, and end it there. That's it. <laughs> Over and done. Hello. Piece of cake. Because your definition from that moment on is going to cause you to stumble and fumble and fall on your own definition. The very fact that you use the word God should represent undefinable. I mean, sure, you want to go in there and say the Godhead and you know what He's revealed in the Father and the Son and the Spirit. You know that that helps for us to you know kind of have a relationship. You know, helps to you know kind of know who you're talking to. But as far as what He is, um, I think we need to go back to the not definable. One of the things that God tried to say to Moses wasn't just that I am that I am and then start calling me I am. It was more I will be what I will be or also in the revelation or in the, the context of the scripture it says, look, you don't know who I am. You know, you can't put a name on me. You can't name me because in naming me, you're defining me and I'm undefinable. I'm beyond you. I'm so incomprehensible that I just simply exist. I exist that I exist, and beyond existence you don't understand. And so we come up with I am anyways. Go figure. <laughs> Rather than I will be what I will be, which is what a Jewish way of says it. You know, Jewish Jewish context usually says, I will be what I will be to my people, I will be what I will be. And there's there's a whole expression and a whole liturgy behind the whole idea of a Jewish way of looking at God and Moses and at the time that I was saying it than to just simply say, as we do in the Western culture, I am, you know, or I am that I am, you know, and make it as though it were to be, you know, or not to be. That is the question, whether I am or I'm not, or whether it is or wasn't, but it is existential, which means that it's beyond our comprehension. Because if we're created, how could we understand Creator? So, I like being belligerent, in some ways, about my faith. It's kind of like one way of saying, hey, I just look and see what's happening and I go with the flow, Joe. You know, I, mean, I go with the flow, don't you know? I mean, that's how I operate. If it's obviously working, then do it. I mean, to me, it's kind of like, well, if 1 plus 1 equals 2 and it works every time you do it, then 1 plus 1 equals 2. It's kind of like, I think they call it axioms razor, when you've eliminated all the impossible and the obvious is there, the obvious must be probable, you know, or something like that. I forget how it goes. Akeem razor. But the point being, it works. It works. And for me, that's what was humorous about watching my wife grow in her relationship with me and then her relationship with God. I can tell you probably for months on end, every day for a while, she would come back and say, I hate you. Because every day it would be just something I wasn't even paying attention to. And I'd say something and it would be it would come true. It would happen. It's not like prophecy, but it would just come true. It'd be something that, you know, she'd be dealing with, you know, and I'd say, well, you know, when you when you do that, this happens, you know, so do this, you know, and then do this and work, and she'd go, I hate you. And the next day it'd be like the word in her Bible study when she's reading the Bible, or it'd be a word like when she was like going along and she'd hear it on the radio, or it'd be, you know, on Caleb, or it'd be always something, somewhere, somehow, that she would find it in all these different places, something I said. And I would look at her like, Okay. <laughs> yeah. So? <laughs> when in reality, I know what you're going through because I've been there. You know what it's like when you go to a church, you know, and you're sitting there in a pew, you know, and you think the pastor's talking to you. <laughs> and no, I don't mean the churches that use psychology. There are a lot of churches that, I'll be honest with you, if you stand on a pulpit, okay, a stage, forget the pulpit for a minute. Let's just talk rock star, okay? Let's be rock stars for a moment. Let's get up there on stage and look at the audience. You can see the audience, pretty much. At least you can see the first few rows, unless you're really a rock star and you're really blitzed out of your mind and you've got all the bright lights and the smoke and you can't see anything. <laughs> okay, let's forget the rock star for a moment. Let's go to reality. Say you're a speaker in an auditorium. Well, you know, even with the lights down low, you can see the first couple rows. Well, in the first couple rows, you can see faces. 
And on those faces, you can see expressions. And a certain amount of speaking speakers and speaking engagements, people learn to gauge their articulation or the way that they present their message by the response from the people, whether they have their hands crossed, whether they're snoring, whether they're sleeping, whether they're paying attention, whether they're taking notes, all those kinds of things. And some churches in going to seminary or going to theology school are taught to gauge their message by the people and the response. Good luck on that one. Man, I tell you, that's a hard road to follow. And so they adjust themselves according to the people. Well, I'm not talking about that. <laughs> I'm talking about when you go to a church, you know, and you know darn well that there's no way that guy could have known what you were going through. There's no way that your wife kibitz, you know, and went up there and spoke to him on the side, you know, and said, hey, you know, my husband, you know, he's been having a golf game, you know, and he's been shooting in the low 60s, you know, and he wants to shoot in the high 70s because, you know, he's tired of being a pro, he wants to be an amateur, you know, and suddenly you break an arm, you know, and then you go, you go into a church, and I'm going to make this really bizarro because you, you don't think these things happen. In my life, they do. You know, and the pastor gets up and says something like, well, you know, I was hearing this guy about a guy, you know, that broke his arm, you know, that could no longer shoot in the 60s, but, you know, was now in the 70s and 80s, and he actually decided to count it all joy. And the guy sitting there is looking at his wife going, you told me. And, quite frankly, the wife's going, no, I didn't, honey. And the guy's going, no way. Uh-uh. Not a chance. You told him. And the reality of the fact is that, no, the two incidences are probably not connected, but God connects them. God makes them work in a connection that you can't see because the pastor may know somebody that actually went through the circumstances of life, broke their arm, went from being a pro into a semi-pro or whatever, you know, and he was just using that story because, you know, it happened to be in his little notes for the day, you know. But at the same time, God, knowing that he was going to bring this guy to church that day, says, hey, I'm going to, you know, inspire my servant to speak something, and that person that's sitting in the audience is going to make a connection. <laughs> Watch this. I'm going to blow his mind. He's going to know there's something more to life than just coincidences or coincidences. Hello? That's what happens. And that's how some people get saved. I mean, to be honest with you, is that that is a big way, in part, that some people get saved. And in some ways, that's how some people don't get saved, because some people use these salvation messages that are generic, you know, that they kind of get through this whole shtick, you know, of playing certain emotional responses that people volunteer to do something because they're emotive, you know, they feel very emotional at the moment, you know, and sometimes some get saved, sometimes some don't. But really, what I'm talking about is more than that. I'm talking about, like, what we just said. First of all, the guy broke his arm. Second of all, he was in the 60s. Second, third of all, he went to the 70s. And fourth of all, it fit the circumstances by way of the person being there. I see that all the time. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> I, I, I wish I could say I don't. <laughs> Please, don't, don't stone me. <laughs> don't call me a prophet or anything. I'm not. You know, I'm just saying, hey, it happens to everybody, everywhere, really. If you just be there with God. Because God will use your life the same way. You don't know what you're saying. You don't have to think about it. Just shoot off your mouth. Um, no, not really. I'm serious. <laughs> Please don't do that. You're going to get stoned if you do. I mean, stoned not in the sense of getting stoned, you know, like by way of smoking it. But somebody's going to throw a rock at you or hit you in the mouth. <laughs> no, don't shoot off your mouth. But, you know, I mean, when God inspires you to say something, you know, say it. Or just, you know, when you're talking... Don't be surprised if the words that come out of your mouth, God uses those, including his word, to go forth and accomplish the purpose he wants to have happen in a person's life. Because he will use circumstances to bring about something in another person's life to inspire them. And that's why we know there is, quote unquote, a personal God. Not just God, like, you know, we could say, you know, Inshallah or God if God wills, or, you know, God is Allah, or all that stuff. No, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about a personal living father that Jesus talked about. Jesus said, hey, you know, everybody's got a God. You, know, you got the gods of the Romans, you got the gods of the Greeks, you got the gods of the heathens, you got gods everywhere. You even got the unknown God. 
And they're all talking about God. You know, good golly molly, you know, they got God for that too. And Jesus said, but I'm talking to you about my Father in heaven. My Father, the one I know. My Father. You know, creator of the universe. The Lord. And so, we are talking about a personal Father that's intimate with you, that knows your circumstances and uses them to accomplish His purpose in designing life to inspire others, like He did with my wife. And that's why my wife would come up to me and say, I hate you. Because <laughs> it just kept happening and happening and happening and happening and happening. And I mean, after two or three years, you figure she'd give up. <laughs> no. <laughs> now she just comes up and says, guess what? <laughs> She didn't say I hate you, but she, you know, she she comments every now and then. You know, I know it happens more often than that. But you know, I'll ask her, you know, things. I'll say, well, hey, what did you, what did you read in your devotional? You know, what did you get out of it? You know, or like now, because I know she's grown in the Lord. I'll I'll ask her after church when we go to church. You know, like, hey, what did you learn? What did you, what did God speak to you about? How did you, how did you get? What was the you know important part of the message to you? What did you, you know, hear God's voice speak to you about? We'll talk about it, you know, we'll share, and we'll, I'll listen, and I'll, I'll always be impressed, you know. Um, pretty much the same thing I heard, you know. <laughs> it's just like, well, you know, I mean, we're on the same page, you know, but then again, the place we're going right now, it would be hard to get anything else out of it, because it, believe me, where I'm going right now is pure Word of God. I mean, it's nice. It's like, oh, thank you. <laughs> Everything is obvious about what direction and point and perspective, whatever. But it also fits our circumstances more so because sometimes when it's talking about direction, we already know where we're going. In. So God just seems to confirm things. Like when my wife was leaving to go to take care of her dying husband, you know, I mean dying husband, dying father. Um, it was a, a lesson, it was a message on the church at Smyrna and going through great tribulation. And that one of the things that the pastor brought out, or that the message was about, that the Holy Spirit was revealing, was that that false teaching that God won't give you something bigger than you can handle because the scripture says God will most definitely give you things over and over again that are bigger than you can handle but he also provides a way of escape that you'll be able to bear it now he was talking about temptation but it also applies to the revelation of his will in doing things and accomplishing things that you can't do on your own because Jesus said it over and over and over again when he was talking to his disciples with man it is impossible but with God all things are possible so Whenever you run into those circumstances where you find yourself smack up against the wall, don't be surprised. Don't be shocked. That's meant to happen. It's meant to be bigger than you are. So that God could reveal how big He is and how small you are. That you are dependent. You are His dependent. He has responsibility for you. He cares about you. And He will take care of you. And so... I was amazed when my wife, you know, quit saying I hate you and just basically goes about enjoying how God reveals himself to her. So she has her own personal revelation and her own personal relationship with God in an intimate way that no one can take away from her. That it's not dependent upon me and it's not what I say, but it's what she sees happening in her life every day as she lives it out with God intimately and personally. In everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. I love the Lord because he has heard my voice and my supplications. Because he has inclined his ear unto me, therefore will I call upon him as long as I live. When you pray, use not vain repetitions as the heathen do, for they like, and they think that they shall be heard for their much speaking. The Spirit helps our infirmities, but we know not what we should pray for as we ought to. But the Spirit himself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. I will therefore, I will therefore, that men everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. 
If two of you shall agree on earth as touching anything that they shall ask, it shall be done for them of my Father, which is in heaven. And so I, I was blessed today by another coincidence as we just read about prayer because what I spent most of my day in is fighting a massive well not just temptation but trials that were going in uh, trials tribulations and attacks and things that were just going crazy today all over the place and it kind of messed up my schedule and kind of left me kind of like spinning and zooming and grooming you know and kind of like Whoa, what's going on Lord and God brought me to just that that perspective of like writing and posting and focusing in on prayer, you know, and about leaving it there, you know, just give it to God, let it go, and let God do what He wills with it, because you can't defend yourself, you know, you can say you've got the sword of the Spirit and go out there and try hacking it, attacking it, and, you know, thinking that you can see what you can't see, and, you know, knocking down what you don't know, because you don't know where you're swinging that thing and who you're hitting with it, you know, I mean, you could blast out there with a shotgun effect, I guess, what some people do in kind of professing and confessing and naming and claiming and shooting and moving and, you know, kind of, um, I don't even know what they call it now. Now they're using a different kind of profession, you know, that they want to kind of, I don't know. <laughs> it's just, to me, it's like, you, you know, you, you're really working up a sweat about what you don't have to worry about. You know, you just go, Lord, you know, you take care of it. God, you know. It's your business, you know. You, you're the king of the, you're your king. You're the god of the spirit world. You know, you're the king of the universe. You can deal with all this stuff that I can't see. So it's your department. So you take care of your side. I'll take care of my side. And you tell me what I got to do on my side. You know, so God takes care of it. You know, it's, well, that was easy. And it's kind of what Jesus did when you see him really in life. You know, it's kind of like he didn't really make a big deal of it. Kind of like moved on to the next thing. And that's what I enjoyed today was that. If you're going through it, you don't have to make a big deal of, you know, like, oh, God, i got to pray and fast and, you know, weep and gnash and cut myself, you know, and slash myself and tie myself up into knots, you know, and strap it on my head and cover it over myself, you know, and get all bound up and wound up. And then I'm kind of like bobbing and weaving and stomping and trying to keep those cramps from happening because, after all, i got my fingers all tied up. i got my head all bound up, you know, and I've kind of got my covering over so nobody can see that I'm already getting cramps from everything just being shrouded around me. Oh, we're talking Jewish. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Ooh. Okay, maybe you guys that are like, you know, getting down on your knees, you know, kind of like, hey, I'm not being Catholic. Not me, man. My knees are bad. <laughs> I'm not bending the knee that way, you know. I'll bend the knee when I need to, but hey, guess what? We're not going down like a Catholic goes down. I mean, those guys, they'll even afflict themselves, you know. Uh-uh. Beat myself with a stick or even get up on that cross. No. But, or worse than that, you know, kind of like try to fumble with beads, you know, I'm not, I'm not fumbling with, you know, any kind of like rosary thingy, you know, because guess what, I got arthritis in my fingers, so I'm kind of left out in the cold when it comes to all the traditions of men, because God's taken them away from me, <laughs> oh, I can still do them, I mean, they're fun to try for a while, you know, it's like, I've said a rosary, you know, and kind of like, mm, it was kind of neat, you know, you know, our Father, our in heaven, hallowed be thy name. The kingdom come, thy will be done. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. You know, blessed art thou among women, blessed are the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. One. Our Father, art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. The kingdom come, thy will be done. Two. Three. You know, kind of, you know. Or like the missile, you know, when the Jews are going like, you know, this way and that way and up the way or down way. And we got, we got the king. We got the spirits on the left, the spirits on the right, God in the middle, God in the back, God in the forward, God below us, God above us, God be behind us, God in, you know, or the scrolls, you know, he wars. Kiss that sucker, it's dirty. <laughs> you know, but oh, kiss the Torah, you know, okay. Kiss the girls and make them cry. Uh, kiss that Torah, make me cry. But God, in my life, has made it so simple that just, you know, when I want a Pepsi. <laughs> I just think about it, and God goes, Ooh, I want to bless my son. <laughs> I want to give him something, give him a kick in the head. You know, he just goes, oh, thank you, God. <laughs> yeah. And that's kind of what prayer should be, a kick in the head. It's kind of like, well, you know, you pray once, it's done. Go for it, you know, and go on with it. Get on with it, get over it. But I will admit, oh, 
I pray daily <laughs> for Pepsi. <laughs> and I get one. No, I'm kidding. I give thanks daily for Pepsi, because I got one. <laughs> Pretty much. And, you know, it's just the delight of the Father to give to his children that which they ask for. And that's what really prayer should be about. It should be coinkadink in a lot of ways of things happening in circumstances. And, you know, you get to a place where you kind of just automatically, you know, you kind of expect it, you know, and you kind of give thanks for it, you know, and you kind of go along and you go, yeah, that's, that's my God. That's my father. He did it. He's cool. He works it out. He takes care of it. Matter of fact, I don't know about you, but my daddy's in charge. He's got it covered. You know what? He's got me covered, too. That's why we call it grace. So, I enjoy sometimes, you know, watching, waiting, being expectant of how God's going to reveal things. Not if God's going to do things. Because I know He will. Because He loves me. And maybe that's the key to your prayer life. That's the key to your intimacy of having conversation with God in recognizing when He is doing something and giving Him thanks for what He has done that really had nothing to do with what you thought it was, but God used it anyway in your life to reveal Himself that He's that personal, that intimate, and that real.